Good morning, Church. Welcome to Emmanuel EFC's Sunday service at home. If you're, if you're joining us for the first time or second time, we'd like to warmly welcome you to our service. It's really August, and it's the first Sunday of August this year. As, as our churches practice on the first Sunday of the month to partake of the Holy Communion. As we sing our two songs, let us be reminded of the cross and what we believe in. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. Gift of life, I'm in that place once again. I'm in that place once again. Once again, I look upon the cross where you died. I'm humbled by your everlasting our father everlasting the all creating one god almighty 
through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection That we will rise again For I believe in the name of Jesus And our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe in God. Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus, I believe Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus, I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in eternal I believe in the virgin's birth I believe in the saints communion and in your holy church I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again for I believe in the name of Jesus Thank you, Tristan and the worship team for leading us into this time of meaningful worship this morning. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. This morning being the first Sunday of the month, we will continue our worship 
with the celebration of the Lord's Supper or the Holy Communion. In this communion, we are called to remember Christ's redeeming work on the cross. As we remember that Jesus came, he revealed God to us and rescued us from sin and death. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, that whenever we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Listen to the welcoming words our Saviour Christ says to all who turn to him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. At the heart of the Christian life is active trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death for sin. The Lord's Supper is an outward and visible sign of the grace shown to us in Christ. As we share bread and wine together, we are invited to feed on him in our faiths, in our hearts by faith, with thanksgiving. We are faced again with God's love for the unworthy and are strengthened by faith in the one whose body was given and whose blood was shed for us. Come then with heartfelt repentance and genuine trust in the Lord Jesus, recognizing the significance of sharing in this way. Knowing the goodness of God and the times we fail to respond with love and obedience, let us confess our sins together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way. For the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and turn to his Son Jesus Christ, in whom there is no condemnation. Amen. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. He is worthy of all praise. We praise and thank you, Heavenly Father, for every spiritual blessing in Jesus our Lord, in whom we have the forgiveness of sins, the gift of your Spirit, and the hope of sharing in your glory. We who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of your Son. He loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Therefore, we lift our voices to praise you, saying, Glory be to God in the Church and in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. As we eat this bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death. We do this until he returns. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Please hold the bread in your hands and we will partake of it together. Jesus says, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread together. Jesus says, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the cup together. Let us pray. Loving Father, 
through faith in your Son and his saving death, our sins are forgiven and we share in the life of this body with gratitude for all your mercies. We offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Before we proceed with the congregational prayer, let me draw your attention to a few announcements which can be found in the bulletin online also. We, re we rejoice with Elisa Thang who will be furthering her studies in the US and she will be flying together with Andrea on the 3rd of August, that's tomorrow, and uh, she will share a little more about her plans and Pastor Hon Chen will then pray for her after this. Attention is also drawn to the OMF conference, the Take Part Missions Workshop, which will be happening online on the 15th of August. If you want to find out what more about missions and what it's all about and how you can be a part of God's mission for the world, then this introductory workshop is for you. It's free, there's no cost, so please sign up with Joshua Chai or through the registration link that's provided. It will be a two-hour session on the day from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. and continues from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Also, please take note that baptism classes will begin on the 4th of August. And if you have yet to sign up, this please get in touch with Pastor Hon Chien uh, as soon as possible. The classes will be the class will be conducted in English and Mandarin. Once again, we are reminding everyone that on next Sunday will be the new normal uh, and a first step towards opening up the church uh, for physical Sunday service. So a small group of people who are in the low risk category in terms of age and health will begin next week. Do continue to visit the website to find out more about our service at home and for more information about the official opening of the church. Let us now join our hearts together in the congregational prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you, we rejoice in knowing that you, our Almighty God, who made us, called us to be your people, the very sheep of your pasture. We rejoice in your steadfast and everlasting love that drew us to you, the gift of so great a salvation through Christ our Saviour and Lord. Thank you for gathering us as your church here this morning together with the Church Universal. Enable us to be lights in this dark world by the light of your word and the power of your spirit. Help us to become a people who seek to do your will, who walk in step with your spirit, both here as a congregation, whether we are in our homes, our neighborhoods, our workplaces and schools to be your witnesses of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we also pray this morning for our nation, Malaysia, which is going through such big challenges. We pray for the government and all those who are in authority. And we humbly ask you to fill our government on earth with the spirit of wisdom, protected from evil and corrupt men. Support them with your grace, those who have been elected to represent the people, to fear you, who will speak out boldly for justice and righteousness, and who strive for peace and security of all citizens. We pray especially for our DG of Health Services and his team at this time, and for those who are in the front line of the, of the work, 
tirelessly battling the pandemic that affects all of us. Grant them success through prudent and wise strategies, enable also the other sectors to return to a balance so that people's work and jobs may not be jeopardized, especially for those who are most needy and poor. Father, we also want to pray for those who are personally afflicted by this hardship economically and for those who are afflicted by illness and sickness. Please, we want to uphold them in this for your consolation of your grace. Support them with your strength and make them partakers of your, your victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to uphold our brothers Roger Chua and Mr. Leng, our sisters Sharon Long and Christelle, that you'll ref refresh them, Lord, with your grace. We also continue to uphold our sister Swet Yen and Siu Kim, our brother John Hu, in their long-term therapies for improvement, that you sustain them and restore them according to your will. Father, at this time, we also want to ask you for guidance on all those who minister the truth, who serve as full-time workers and pastors in your kingdom. Lord, they are subject to the schemes of the evil one. We ask that you protect them, therefore, with your shield of grace. Furnish them strength of patience so that Satan's traps cannot trip them. Especially pray for Jeremy this morning as he immerses himself in his studies at MBS and in the four causes and the assignments that are due later this month. Grant him discipline to apply himself in finishing these assignments and be with him and others as he works together with the other responsibilities that he is engaged with. We ask Lord that you also Enable him to truly benefit from these studies more than just in acquiring academic skills. But enable him to grow in maturity and, and fulfill your, your vision for his life. We pray that you'll be with him and the team that plans to visit the arrangements being made as the camp committee at uh, grant them safety and in travel and at this time too. Lord, we also want to pray for Pastor Eugene. We thank you for having called him and empowered him by your grace to lead the pastoral team. Grant him the joy of serving you as he faithfully preaches, teaches, shepherds the flock, and exhorts us by your word. Help him to manage his time between his marketplace work and church. We are deeply grateful and thankful, Lord, for Audrey and the family and for their support and understanding in his call. Help him and Audrey especially to find daily mercies as they work and manage the family whilst caring for the church too. Protect them in the work of the kingdom and encourage them by their care for one another as they help to build the unity of the church. Grant Pastor Eugene the perseverance to fulfill your vision to steer the church through these challenging times, to remain connected with the members and to be sensitive to the pastoral needs of the team that he leads and of all members of the church. And now, Lord, we ask humbly to, as Pastor Eugene brings the word from Romans to us this morning, grant him the unction of your spirit that he would speak a word in season to us. We ask, Lord, that you would also arouse our hearts to listen to your voice. Grant us grace 
to guard the deposit of your word with a pure heart and with patience to produce fruit that is pleasing to you. May we hear attentively, may we hear carefully, and may we hear it fruitfully. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi Church. Today we have Elisa here with us. She will be furthering her studies in the States uh, and she will be leaving on Monday. So today we want to hear a little bit from her and we want to pray for her. I uh, just have a few questions for you. First is, where are you going? Uh, which university and what are you studying? Okay. Um, I'll be going to Northwestern College. It's in Iowa and it's a Christian college and I'll be studying English teaching. What's that one thing that you are looking forward to the most? Mm, I'm looking forward to building good relationships with my uh, professors and also my uh, the students there. Uh, relationships whereby we can encourage each other and learn from each other. Do you have any prayer requests that we can remember you in prayer? Mm. Uh, because it will be a time of many adjustments, tra transitioning to college life and also life in another country. So I really appreciate your prayers that I may stay close to the Lord no matter what happens. And I also like to take this time to thank the church uh, because you have all blessed me man in many, many ways, uh, whether small or big. I really thank you and uh, may God bless all of you. Have to pray for protection from the COVID there, yeah. Since the case is very serious there. Uh, personally, I would like to thank Elisa also for uh, all her service and contribution, especially in church and also in the friendship. And I really admire your uh, quiet confidence and a servant heart when it comes to serving in the YA, college CG, and even just going visitation and to meet people. And I think these are small seeds of uh, greater things that God has installed for you. So I really look forward to that. Come, let's, let's pray and commit uh, you into the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you for the words of uh, King David from Psalms 139, which says, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. As Elisa will be flying halfway across the world, we take comfort that you are there with her to guide her and that you will hold her fast in your arms and you will assure her that she is your treasured possession and that she can look forward to new experiences where she will grow as a person, grow in her knowledge, grow in her skills, grow in a circle of friends and most importantly, grow in her delight in who you are and your good purposes for her. We pray for special protection as she travels and protection over the serious threat of the uh, virus over there. We also want to pray that she will be able to be surrounded by godly friends and a church that will deepen her knowledge in your word and deepen her experience of your grace in your community. So may your peace, may your joy, your love and your strength go with her. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Church. I'm very glad you're able to join our virtual service today. If you have been following our series on the Ten Commandments over the last few months, I hope you have found that helpful. We concluded the Ten Commandments last Sunday, and this month we will continue with the New Testament book of Romans, chapters 5 to 8. Romans and the giving of God's laws in the Old Testament are inextricably linked. Paul, the apostle and author of Romans, 
frequently refers back to the law. And in the context of Romans, the law almost always is referring specifically to God's laws given to the Israelites for the purpose of showing the world what God is like and how we are to be in relationship with Him. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, links even the law to God's grace. In fact, the thread of uh, grace, the grace of God in Jesus Christ, runs through the entire Bible. God, through Paul's writing in Romans, wants us to know and to grasp this. God's grace is revealed through the good news, the gospel that God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, which is the Old Testament in Paul's day. Did you see what Paul is saying? The promises in the Old Testament, the giving of God's law, the writings of the Old Testament prophets, all of these are part of the gospel and we must read and interpret them through the lens of the gospel. But what is this gospel ultimately about? It is about God's Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, in the flesh, will be a descendant of David. He's not alien or foreign from the human race. He's not an angelic being, but fully human, truly one of us. People dying is usually not good news, but Jesus died for your sins and my sins, and that is good news because we do not receive what our sins deserve, that is, God's holy wrath. Instead, we receive what we don't deserve, that is, God's forgiveness over our sins and our adoption as God's children. Through his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ was proven to be who he said he was, the Son of God. Now, people have been resuscitated or revived before, and they will still die again. But there have not been any bodily resurrection before, until Jesus rose from the dead. That same resurrection power and life is given to those who belong to Christ, so that they can be with him and reign with him forever in a creation that is renewed without sin, without the current problems that we feel so depressed and helpless and upset about, be it death, pain, suffering, disease, corruption, racism, enmity between people and between people and God. If that somehow does not seem exciting or appealing, then the fault is mine for not having the ability to articulate it better or with a more engaging personality. But I'm afraid all of you have to share the blame also for not having a bigger imagination of God and His promises to us in Jesus Christ. We are all still thinking in small earthly terms with earthly limitations. And Paul goes to great lengths to remind us that the gospel is truly the power of God to save us, to save people so they can truly live the lives that they were meant to live without the shackles of sin and decay, experiencing that life in glimpses in the here and now and in its fullness in the eternal life to come. We have to remind ourselves that as good and as wonderful as our lives can be now, it will be but a pale shadow of what we will experience in eternity with God. In the Gospel, God reveals His plan and solution to pronounce guilty and condemned sinners as righteous before His holy presence. This solution works for everyone on the basis of their faith, that is, their complete trust in Christ alone as the one who is able to rescue them from death. So, Romans is deeply theological and doctrinal, where Paul goes to great lengths to expound on the gospel of justification by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, 
the gospel is unlike anything that men or women can create in terms of religion or a belief system, where God declares us sinners as righteous in His judgment, not by things that we do, but on the basis of what He Himself accomplishes through the completed work that Jesus Christ did and how we respond to God's gift in Christ. The great reformer, Martin Luther, called Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26, the center of the entire Bible. Such was its impact to him that eventually led to the Protestant Reformation. This letter is Paul's most systematic writing and explanation of many key and foundational doctrines of the Christian faith. As we learn and know more about God, the correct response is that it must lead us to not more pride and knowledge, but an ever-growing sense of the increasing measure of God's majesty, His glory, something which we will explore more later, and His goodness. In other words, the more we learn and the more we know about God, the more we recognize how small and insignificant we are in and of ourselves, but how big God is. And in spite of the gulf between us, creator and creature, how much he loves us through Christ and how much significance he gives to us when we belong to him. If we think we have fully understood God, our God is too small. So let's think big about God and think after God's own thoughts as we continue our exploration into Romans. What is the big deal? What is the significance? Or to put it in secular marketplace language, what is the value proposition of being justified by faith in Jesus Christ? As verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, firstly, an immense burden has been removed from us. God takes it away at the cross of Christ. We are all different and have different issues and burdens, such as some of us have a deep sense of guilt, some have fear, others feel shame or anxiety of what God thinks and what others think of us. Many feel the need to work and perform in order to meet expectations, that of their own and others. They don't work for the joy of doing good work that brings pleasure and satisfaction to God and to themselves, or joy in work that helps others, or just for the joy of being able to work. And of course, the root burden of our sin, our inclination to live lives for ourselves, in separation and in rebe rebellion with God. Now, we may not even realize that we have any of these or other burdens because we don't know what true freedom is. Freedom without these burdens. Our idea of freedom is usually limited to somewhere between, on the one hand, personal financial freedom so that we don't have to work to earn a living and be able to enjoy the life that we want to, and on the other hand, total freedom to do whatever we want without anyone telling us what to do. Human experience and history has shown us that once you look beyond the facade or the outside appearance, this kind of freedom is actually more enslaving rather than free. True freedom is to enjoy God forever, to live for Him and not ourselves. Uh, the reason why we, we feel that we still have uh, those burdens is mainly because we are still clinging on to them like a favorite pillow or blanket or some comfort thing. We must learn to yield these burdens to God and to trust Him. Now, for those of you who are not yet justified by faith in Christ, in other words, you are not yet a disciple of Christ who trusts in his grace and sacrifice for your sins. Jesus himself 
extends his invitation to you. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Please don't brush off the invitation of Jesus. He's asking you to come to him so that he can take your burden away and you will find rest for your soul and enjoy true freedom in the newness of life that he promises. So firstly, God removes our sin and burdens through Christ. Secondly, through this faith in Christ, we who were at one time enemies with God have been brought near to God. In other words, Christ reconciles us with God through our faith in Him. The result of this reconciliation is peace with God. Peace with God? Now, if that does not sound exciting or appealing at first, because honestly, you're probably thinking, is that something I really need right now? I've got projects that are overdue. I need more time, not peace with God. I'm overworked. I've not had a real holiday in years. I need some me time immediately. Peace with God can be considered when things are more relaxed. I'm struggling to make ends meet. I need a new job, a higher paying job. I'm unwell. I'm having a chronic illness. I'm just tired and depressed with my lot in life. I need healing and a cure. I feel unappreciated and taken advantage of. I don't need peace. I need recognition for my abilities and efforts. Well, if you are thinking along those lines, then as I said earlier, our God is too small and He's either only there to serve our needs and wants or we don't want Him in our lives at all. Thank you very much. What exactly does peace with God mean? Peace in this context is not merely the absence of trouble or conflict. The sense of the meaning conveyed by the word peace includes calmness and tranquility, which are the common meanings. But more than that, it also includes blessing, freedom from worry and anxiety. Yes, even prosperity in life and health. Now, those are all good things that every human being yearns for. And you could argue convincingly that you can experience those things without God. You don't even need the positive thinking self-help gurus to tell you this. But when we have peace with God, these things take on a new and immeasurably more powerful meaning and experience because we move from our self-focused smallness to God-sized potential. A couple of simple analogies might help to illustrate. Imagine a child having only experienced the small playground near his house. He's happy playing there. He doesn't know of any better playground. To him, that's the best playground and he doesn't need more. Now, people say simple contentment is a good thing, but this child hasn't seen or experienced Disneyland. Or if your regular diet consists of only bland oats, which are healthy and good, why would you need anything else, right? But your taste buds haven't yet experienced the eating of mutton curry, asam laksa, or char kway teow. My family and I just returned from a foodie trip to Penang, uh, hence those examples. Now you could add durian in that list too if you want, although I've personally not quite developed uh, a fondness for durian. You could say I'm missing out on something that most Malaysians consider a very big thing, but maybe after I receive a new resurrection body, I will acquire the taste for durian. 
Now, these are, of course, secular examples, but hopefully it reminds us that our good experiences without God are like the small playground and bland oats. This peace with God is an unbreakable and unshakable peace because God is the one that provides the promise and holds us to himself. And that, that is the benefit of justification by faith. Our relationship with God is grounded on Jesus Christ, who, who he is and what he has done. And Christ will never, ever let us down. If it were due to our good works and moral performance, we would never be sure if we were good enough. We would have to keep performing to even think there might be a chance for us and keep doing and doing because the more we do, the better we are, we hope. And then God has to accept us. But even then, can we be sure that we are accepted by a holy God who is justly wrathful against our sin. Peace with God comes from knowing that it is Jesus who has done everything that is required to satisfy God's righteous demands. And that, that is liberating. It's not just somebody who has done something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. It is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who has done it all for us. If God is for us, who can be against us? Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Alas, we have trust issues, don't we? We also have pride issues. We hold back and we are not sure whether Jesus is the right one to follow. Think of the great football teams. In order to succeed, they trust their manager and follow his, his instructions and strategy. Liverpool FC waited 30 years. That's nearly two lifetimes for the average pro footballer. And they went through multiple managers before reaching the pinnacle of the Premier League this year. But we have Jesus Christ, God's Son in the flesh, who has brought us peace with God. It is Christ we must trust and follow. He is the only one who keeps all his promises, is fully trustworthy, is faithful, reliable, and all-powerful. And he promises to make a new creation of all who trust in him. Justification by faith in Christ brings us peace with God. Without Christ, it is impossible to approach God because the Bible tells us that God is utterly holy and dwells in unapproachable light. Only when clothed with the righteousness of Christ can one approach God. So, through Christ, we have access to God's immeasurably glorious presence. It is an undeserved privilege because we cannot earn it. That is what grace is. God turns his face towards us and grants us his kindness, his goodwill and favour through Christ. We are in a privileged position with a certain standing just as if we were given the honour of meeting the king in his throne room. Except, in this case, God is the king of all creation. Now, you might think that this is the ultimate case of being starstruck, like meeting your favorite superstar celebrity, uh, or a royal dignitary, or VVIP, and that that could not be further away from the truth. In God's presence, we come to the one who created us, who knows every fiber of our being, who sees through our hearts and our minds, who knows us fully, and yet loves us deeply with a love that is vast beyond all measure. This is the grace that we stand in, which means it's not superficial. We're not standing on or at the side of grace, but in it. We are now 
and always will be continuously experiencing grace because we are literally standing in it. We need to start learning how to see God's grace in our lives and relationships in every aspect of our waking and sleeping, working and playing, serving and being served, big and small circumstances, even through suffering and difficult situations. Can you see that God has been gracious, is gracious and will be gracious to you? Have you experienced His kindness and favour in your life? If you haven't, begin with what Christ did for you on the cross. What then is the outcome and result of having and experiencing this privileged grace? We rejoice in our hope of the glory of God. It leads us to a rejoicing in the hope of our future state with God. Yes, we are with God now, but this is only the beginning. What we will be has not yet been revealed, as John reminds us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared or not yet been revealed. God's glory is a phrase that appears many times in the Bible. The Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible says that the glory of God is an undefinable term. That's helpful. It is because we realize that we reach the limits of human language to describe an infinite God and His glory. But at a minimum, the glory of God will include His majesty, His splendor, His brilliance, and you can keep adding more and more superlative adjectives and nouns to this list. We see bits of it in the beauty and diversity of creation in space, in nature and life. It also helps to have an active imagination to magnify the sense of God's glory as what you would imagine when you read the Narnia Chronicles, for example, through the mind of C.S. Lewis, or see how Peter Jackson tries to capture the splendor of Rivendell, Lothlorien, or Erebor in his movies. God also tells us his glory is his alone and he will not give it to another. However, his creation reflects his glory and he will share his glory with us. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 43, for example, Jesus tells us the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. So we experience a shadow and a glimpse of that glory in the here and now, but we have our ultimate hope in Christ and the glory of God. We must stretch our imagination of the incomparable sense and taste of it as we eagerly wait in anticipation. Therefore, we are looking forward to a future glory with Christ in the presence of God, in the new heavens and new earth. For now, let our imagination be amplified through the lens of Scripture. Now, peace with God and standing in the grace and our hope in the glory of God give us the solid foundation on which we must live our lives in the here and now. Otherwise, we will easily succumb to despair, hopelessness and bitterness when things don't go well. Or worse, we completely reject any notion of God, thinking that it is freedom and wise. Suffering is a precursor to the coming glorious age. Jesus himself gave us a clue to this when he says that in this world, we will have trouble. But even so, we are not to lose hope but to be conscious that he has overcome the world. We rejoice, not so much in the sense that suffering makes us worthy, as if God is obligated to bless me now since I'm going through suffering for him, because that is just another form of works righteousness and trying to earn favor from God. Suffering seems senseless on the one hand, when, for example, a tsunami wipes out 
several hundred thousand people or a pandemic kills even more or on a more personal level a parent has to see their baby die some of you experience chronic illnesses and uh, don't have a permanent cure and the list goes on C.S. Lewis says that suffering is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world it tells us that something is clearly not right with us and with the world and that hope is to be f hope is not to be found within us but as we go through suffering god is even big enough to graciously and powerfully use it to develop our endurance character and hope in him but the sequence is critically important first through jesus christ we have peace with god and we stand in the grace of Jesus, knowing that this is a privileged gift we do not deserve or earn. Only then are we able to rejoice even in the face of suffering because God is shaping and preparing us for His glory. As we bring this to a close, firstly, let's learn to cast our burdens unto Christ and revel and delight in our peace with God, knowing that it is Jesus who has done everything that is required to satisfy God's righteous demands of us. Secondly, let's continuously learn to see God's grace in every aspect of our lives, giving Him thanks and praise, and building our sense of anticipation and imagination of God's glory as we hope and long for it. And finally, as we experience peace with God, as we stand in His grace, and as we put our hope in His glory that will, will be revealed in us, let us endure and even rejoice in our sufferings, recognizing that in the light of eternity, these are just momentary troubles. Christ alone is enough for us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to praise you for Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Saviour, who for the joy set before him endured the cross for our sake. We pray that you will remind us through the gospel of how much you love us, enable us to experience a fresh peace with God, your gracious hand in our lives and our glorious hope in you so that our momentary sufferings will not wear us down, but will instead increase our dependence and love for you. And now, may the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus the Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Have a great week ahead, and God bless you all.